Hey, I'm my name is Zeb, and welcome to the Smile Dog Creepypasta. I first met in person Mary E. in the summer of 2007. I had arranged with her husband of 15 years, Terence, to see her for an interview. Mary had initially agreed, since it was not a newsman, but rather an amateur writer gathering information for a few early college assignments and, if all went according to plan, some pieces of fiction. We scheduled the interview for a particular week when I was in Chicago for unrelated business, but at the last moment Mary changed her mind and locked herself in a couple's bedroom, refusing to meet with me. For half an hour I sat with Terence as we camped outside the bedroom door, listening and taking notes while he attempted fruitlessly to calm his wife. The things Mary said made little sense, but fit with the pattern I was expecting. That I could not see her, I could tell from her voice that she was crying. More often than not, her objections to speak with me centered around an incoherent dear tribe on her dreams, her nightmares. Terence apologized profusely when we ceased the exercise, and I did my best to take it in stride. We called that I wasn't a reporter in search of a story, but merely a curious young man in search of information. Besides, I thought at the time I could perhaps find another, similar case if I put my mind and resources to it. Mary E. was a size-up for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system in 1992 when she first encountered Smile.J Pack, and her life changed forever. She and Terence had been married for only five months. Mary was one of an estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the BBS, though she is the only one who has spoken openly about the experience. The rest have remained anonymous, or are perhaps dead. In 2005, when I was only in 10th grade, Smile JPEG was first brought to my attention by my burgeoning interest in web-based phenomena. Mary was the most often cited victim of what is sometimes referred to as Smile.Dark, the being Smile JPEG is reputed to display. What caught my interest, other than the most obvious macabre elements of the cyber legend and my proclivity towards such things, was the sheer lack of information. Usually to the point that people didn't believe it even exists other than as a rumor or a hoax. It is unique because, though the entire phenomenon centers on a picture file, that file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly, many photo manipulated simulacra litter the web, showing up with the most frequency on the sites such as the image board Fortune, particularly the axe focused paranormal subboard. It is suspected these are fakes because they do not have the effect the true smell that JPEG is believed to have, namely the sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety. This purported reaction in the viewer is one of the reasons the phantom-like smell that JPEG is regarded with such disdain, since it is patently absurd. Though depending on whom you ask, the reluctance to acknowledge smell that JPEG's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of disbelief. Neither Smile.jpg nor Smile.doc is mentioned anywhere on Wikipedia, though the website features articles on such other, perhaps more scandalous shock sites as Hello.jpg or Two Girls One Cup. Any attempt to create a page pertaining to Smile.jpg is summarily deleted by any of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with Smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legend. Mary E's story is not unique. The unverified rumors of smelted JPEG showing up in the early days of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002 a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website Something Awful with a deluge of smell dog pictures, rendering almost half of the forums users at the time epileptic. It is also said in the mid to late 90s that Smile the JPEG circulated on a Usenet and as an attachment of a chain email with the subject line Smile! God loves you! Yet despite the huge exposure these stunts would generate, there are very few people who admit to having experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has been discovered. Those who claim to have seen some other JPEG often weakly joked that they were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo. A dark-like creature, usually described as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, Illuminated by the flash of the camera, sits in a dim room, the only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, 
but it's usually described as beckoning. Of course, most attention is given to the dog or dog creature as some victims are more certain than others about what they were claimed to have seen. The muzzle of the beast is reputedly split in a white grin, revealing two rows of very white, very straight, very sharp, very human looking teeth. This is, of course, not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims, who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eyes during the time they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue indeterminately, often while the victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. These may be treated with medication, though in some says it is more effective than others. Mary E., I assumed, was not on effective medication. That was why after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore and urban legend-oriented news groups, websites, and mailing lists, hoping to find the name of the supposed victim of Smelda JPEG, who felt more interested in talking about this experience. For a time, nothing happened, and at length I forgot completely about my pursuits. Since I had begun my freshman years of college and was quite busy, Mary contacted me via email. However, near the beginning of March 2008. Dear Mr. L, I am incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer when you came to interview me. I hope you understand it was no fault of yours, but rather my own problems that led me to act out as I did. I realized that I could have handled the situation more decorously. However, I hope you will forgive me. At a time, I was afraid. You see, for 15 years I have been haunted by Smell.jpg. Smell.dog comes to me in my sleep every night. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. There is an inevitable quality about my dreams, my nightmares, that makes them completely unlike any real dreams I have ever had. I do not move, and I do not speak. I simply look ahead, and the only thing ahead of me is a scene that from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand, and I see Smell.dog. Talks to me. It is not a dog, of course, though I am not quite sure what it really is. It tells me it will leave me alone if I only do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. That is how it phrases its demands. And I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received in the mail a manila envelope with no return address. And that was only a three and a half inch floppy diskette. Without having to check, I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co-worker, I could even show it to Terence. As much as the idea disgusts me. And what would happen then? Well, if Smile.Dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me if I did as the creature asked? So I did nothing for fifteen years, though I kept the diskette hidden amongst my things. Every night for fifteen years, Smile Dot Dog has come to me in my sleep and demanded that I spread the word. For fifteen years I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the BBS sport where I first encountered Smile Dot JPEG stopped posting. I've heard some of them committed suicide, others remained completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you forgive me, Mr. L. But last summer when you contacted me and my husband about an interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy diskette. I did not care if Smelter Dog was lying or not. I wanted it to end. You were a stranger, someone I had no connection with, and I thought I would not feel sorrow when you took the diskette as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you arrived, I realized what I was doing. I was plotting to ruin your life. I could not stand the thought, and in fact I still cannot. I am ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope that this warning will dissuade you from further investigating of Smile.jpg. And I hope that this warning will dissuade you from further investigation of Smarter Chair Pack. You may in time encounter someone who is, if not weaker than I, then wholeheartedly more depraved. Some will not hesitate to follow Smarter Dog's orders. Stop while you're still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife killed herself. 
for cleaning up the various things she had left behind, closing email accounts and the like. He had not upon the above message. He was a man shambled. He wept as he told me to listen to his wife's advice. He'd found the diskette, he revealed, and burned it until it was nothing but a stinking pile of blackened plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the diskette had hissed as it melted. Like some sort of animal, he said. I would admit, I was a little uncertain on how to respond to this. At first I thought perhaps it was a joke, with the couple belatedly playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of the several Chicago newspapers' online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of suicide in the article. I decided that, for the time at least, I would not further pursue the subject of small dot jelly pack, especially since I had finals coming up at the end of May. But the world has an odd way of testing us. Almost a full year after I had returned from my disastrous interview with Mary E., I received another email. Hello, I found your email address through a mailing list. Your profile said your interest in Smile Dog. I have saw it. It is not as bad as everyone says. I have sent it to you here. Just spreading the word. The final line chilled me to the bone. According to my email client, there was one file attached called, naturally, Smile Dog JPEG. I considered downloading it for some time. I was most likely a fake. I imagine. And even if it weren't, I was never wholly convinced of Smelter JPEG's peculiar powers. Mary E.'s account had shaken me. Yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyway. After all, how could a simple image do what Smelter JPEG was said to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And if such things were patently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? If I downloaded the image, if I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile Dark came to me in my dreams demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in until I died? Or would I simply spread the word, eager to put to rest? And if I choose the latter route, how would I do it? Whom would I burden in turn? If I went through with my earlier intention to write a short article about Smile.jpg, I decided I could attach it as evidence, and anyone who read the article, anyone who took interest, would be affected. And even assuming the Smile.jpg attached to the email was genuine, would I be capricious enough to save myself in that manner? Could I spread the word? Yes, yes I could. And don't forget, we'll meet each other. See you tomorrow.